Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar uh, as a joint webinar with um, University of Dayton School of Law and WADE. Um, today, uh, the webinar is about human rights, and we have a very prestigious speaker, uh, Professor Shilly, and I'm going to give the floor to uh, Professor Paolianello, who's going to introduce her. We hope you like this presentation. Remember that you can ask questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Good afternoon to everyone. It's always a pleasure to, to share this, this webinar uh, with University of Dayton Law School as a part of the, uh, of the series of events that we have uh, as part of the online LLM. Um, as Paula properly mentioned, today we have a, a highly recognized speaker uh, Professor Jerry Ingalls from uh, University of Dayton Law School. She is the director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. Um, the University of Dayton is pretty famous from uh, developing and working in the human rights path. So uh, Shelly is doing a, a great job in this area. Um, uh, she has worked for the United Nations in the human rights area and she uh, she's teaching right now human rights courses uh, in the University of Leyden School of Law. So uh, it's a great pleasure for, for us to have her here in this webinar. So Shelly, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for making the time to mm -hmm. share with the students at, at WALE today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo and Paula, for the introductions. And what I'm going to talk about today, um, hopefully we can move the the um, screen forward to the start of the presentation. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about human rights under uh, threat today. Um, and I'm doing that as a broad uh, framework for discussing sort of at a meta level where we are with human rights uh, in the 21st century. Um, so just a little bit about me and why this topic. Um, as was mentioned, I'm currently executive director at the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. Um, but my, in my history of work is at the global level. And um, I've been at a, a global international civil servant for, um, over 15 years and before that I lived internationally as a student and as an NGO uh, advocate. So the framework I come from is really a global citizenship framework. It's a, uh, a term which has taken on sort of contemporary recognition um, as something that we strive for educating young people around what it means to be now a global citizen. Um, I'm also a lawyer, as was mentioned uh, at the time that I, I was a young person. When you wanted to do human rights work, um, at that time, most everybody went to law school, at least in the United States. Um, so my frame of reference is a normative one. It's uh, one that comes from uh, both uh, my degree as a, a U.S. lawyer, but also um, the international norms and standards, which prim principally shape our uh, global understanding of human rights. I'm also an American, as was mentioned, so that is definitely an, an orientation, as you know, um, one of, of exceptional privilege. Um, I'm also a, a white American, which is a, a privileged class, even within the class of privilege that comes from uh, being raised in, in the United States. And of course, I was raised like all of us are in um, certain educational systems and, and concepts and perspectives um, that include for America a, a deep sort of driven sense of exceptionalism, particularly aligned to our constitutional governance framework, uh, an idea that we have an exceptional um, way of, of governing um, and we are an exceptional country. And finally, I was, um, you know, very much a product of a generation in which globalization took place uh, over the course of my formative life. Um, so I am a, a, like with global citizenship in terms of my values and orientation, 
also in terms of the realities of the economic, social, and political order um, that that arose during my um, during my lifetime, uh, it's one of, of really rapid rapid globalization. So for those of you who are uh, you know new to human rights, I just wanted to um, do a little bit of a reference of what what is a brief background of what are human rights today. Um, and because I don't know the level of knowledge uh, in this webinar, and I hope um, you all have already taken classes on human rights and have a strong background in international human rights law, some of this might be um, stuff that you already are very aware of. Uh, but hopefully it will ground us in, in a similar point of departure. So uh, as you know, the human rights framework uh, sort of its origin comes from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, although many scholars have pointed to where the norms really come from is a, is a much longer history of normative development before the post-World War II establishment of the United Nations and the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as you all know, is a soft law uh, instrument. Um, it does not have the power of uh, binding um, uh, on its uh, member states, those who sign it. At the same time, it's universally so recognized. Um, it's been translated more than any other document in the world in all the global languages that many parts of it are seen as almost a part of customary international law at this point. Um, that Though that is a controversial, obviously, position, as is any statement of customary international law. But out of the UDHR grew, uh, during the time of the uh, strength and the development of international law um, in other areas as well, human rights was taken on in, in the codification process um, through member states negotiating international treaties um, and member states principally of the United Nations using that framework. Uh, although, as you know, there are also regional human rights instruments that have been negotiated outside of the United Nations framework and within regional bodies and regional institutional frameworks. Um, at that time, the UDHR was split in, in sort of two sets of human rights uh, frames. One uh, was civil and political rights, those that are traditionally understood as freedoms um, for the most part, and that were very aligned to the United States and other European sort of Western orientation on rights. And then social, economic, and cultural rights um, were split into a different treaty that had a different nature of um, uh, binding states and these are around um, traditionally what uh, other states, particularly at the time, uh, the very powerful Soviet Union thought were especially important human rights as it relates to jobs, uh, security, uh, right to education, right to health, et cetera. But those in splitting those uh, uh, treaties and rights into two different treaties, um, it created a hierarchy in which civil and political rights um, were seen as something that states were able to do immediately and economic, social, and cultural rights required resources. And so they would take time for states to be able to ensure these rights. That created a very deep and unhelpful hierarchy to the state of human rights today. And then over the course of um, codification, of course, Human rights have taken on a number of treaties that address the specific needs of specific groups, uh, the most uh, vulnerable and marginalized groups. There are treaties on, as you know, the rights of women, uh, discrimination on the basis of uh, race and um, the rights of persons with disabilities, the rights of children um, and others. And there have been obviously new and emerging areas of human rights that the UDHR and the existing treaties did not address uh, fully the time that, they, that it, they were drafted. And so there are a number of international mechanisms that look at um, these new and emerging areas and create doctrine and create international um, legal uh, understanding of how human rights interact uh, with new and emerging issues. 
There's also been uh, uh, the development of human rights-based approaches, which is where human rights uh, norms themselves guide the approach that institutions or groups take to a particular issue. This is very well known in the development and in the international development field, a human rights-based approach to development, but human rights-based approaches have been used to um, describe how do you integrate human rights into other areas of uh, international and domestic um, issues. So those are, it has been a very strong and very concrete area of expansion of human rights beyond a strictly normative or legal perspective. There has also been special systems developed, as I'm sure you know, that address particular types of human rights violations or human rights needs. We have an international system um, around the rights of refugees. We have the international system around um, international humanitarian law or criminal law um, and an international criminal court um, to hold those most responsible for violations of international human rights and humanitarian law to account. And then human rights has also been the base on which a huge um, network of civil society organizations around the world have used human rights to advocate for um, change within, within their um, governments and at the national level, legislative and policy change, but also other forms of cultural uh, change. And human rights has been a major area of education and training globally. Um, both in the sense of law schools providing international human rights law classes, but more broadly in the sense of training uh, police, for example, around the world on human rights standards or um, standards around torture and training individuals, particularly those groups that are most marginalized or for whom human rights violations are most consistent, such as women, indigenous peoples and others who might not have access to information around what their rights are and ways that they can claim their rights. So human rights has taken on not only legal significant in, significance internationally, it has taken on political significance and it has taken on social uh, and cultural significance in the ways in which um, countries, individuals and groups and institutions work through concepts of human dignity. How do we secure sort of fundamental human rights for people on the basis that they are human and that each individual has an, a, a, a claim, um, a valid claim to be treated with dignity. There's also been the um, further development of more group rights, particularly on the indigenous level, recognizing that individual rights alone don't necessarily take into account the complex social and cultural systems um, that we have in humankind. So if that's our human rights um, framework, uh, there have been in the past uh, quite a range of criticisms um, and uh, weaknesses or assumptions that the human rights, international human rights framework has rested on um, that have come under a lot of critique. And I'm just gonna mention those here because they're important to understanding why we are where we are um, with uh, human rights being so greatly under threat in 2021. So some of the criticisms and assumptions um, that, that sort of have uh, been at the heart of people, of the challenge to human rights, uh, one is that it's, it's deeply grounded in a multilateral system. And so the extent to which that system, primarily the United Nations, but not only that, as we discussed, regional and other um, system institutions and formations, um, that concept of multilateralism is very essential to this idea of global human rights that we all, because of the virtue of our humanity, share a certain set of fundamental um, rights. And where that multilateralism is under attack or where multilateralism has free, uh, weaknesses, so too does the human rights framework in, in multiple ways. Um, not only because you need institutions that uphold human rights and continue to um, use human rights as a, a framework. And if those institutions don't have the buy-in of societies and of states, um, then that undercuts human rights. They also, um, 
don't have the resources to make human rights a reality. And there, um, in, in the multilateralist system, there's obviously been global inequities um, that are reflected there. And so human rights has come under a lot of criticism around its neo-colonialist type of uh, potential agenda or that it is a Western values agenda, that it has been developed purely by Western states and it's being imposed on the global South. This becomes particularly an area of cultural relativism becomes particularly important in particular group rights. Um, for example, women's rights where uh, certain uh, societies um, claim that um, women's rights should take a different manifestation than how they take in, in human rights because of their religious, cultural, or other values. So that has been a longstanding um, critique. And of course, um, the, the, the reality of colonialism in the world is one that has um, infused itself into uh, the global human rights agenda as well. Other critiques go to whether human rights is really um, strong enough and really the correct tool to um, help to address really complex systems, particularly global economic systems um, that undergird uh, extreme inequities and create human rights violations. And many have argued that the sort of normative approach to human rights simply um, takes place within an existing economic and other framework and doesn't principally um, challenge or governance and political framework and doesn't principally challenge uh, or counter those systems. Others have said uh, human rights are too legal and technocratic. They're only accessible to lawyers and taking place in courts. They're very dependent on judicial and legal processes and the strength of uh, laws and um, courts and judges within countries to take them on and to use them. Uh, they're elitist by nature as they are global norms um, and therefore they have limited use to um, individuals and grassroots on the ground. Other critiques are that they are underfunded um, human rights or human rights work is dependent on Western economic sources. You see a lot of this in the attacks on human rights organizations in countries that they are you know, funded by Western donors, that they're part of a foreign agenda, um, that they are usurping uh, national interests, that are, they're in fact reflective of some greater um, outside uh, desire to change the way politics and societies function, or they're not funded sufficiently at all. So um, many uh, talk about how the international and regional human rights institutions and mechanisms don't have adequate capacities and resources to actually take on um, states and other groups who are violating human rights. And another um, critique, and I'll stop here, there are many critiques, but another critique is that they, um, because of the legal nature, because of the institutional and global nature, that they're too top down that they're imposed, they don't um, take into account enough local, uh, cultural and societal realities. Um, so in light of all that, why are human rights today under threat? I think they're under threat for a range of reasons. I'm gonna focus in on, on some of the trends and the challenges in a larger uh, way. Um, there are pre-existing threats to the current time, the COVID pandemic, which I'll talk about in detail. Um, these are threats that uh, were increasingly clear with the, the change of century um, and into the 21st century. So the last 20 years, these threats have become sort of very specific and have had very uh, detrimental impacts on the human rights uh, agenda. Uh, an obvious one and one that continues to be um, and, and is increasingly a threat is uh, global climate change and environmental degradation. Um, this is one that I'll come back to later, um, but is certainly one of the most important threats. Uh, economic and historical inequities, we talked a little bit about that in the past 20 years, the type of globalization. Um, uh, that has happened, particularly free market globalization, um, although many countries in the world still have very uh, strong govern government control over their major economic 
um, uh, institutions and over their major economic resources. But this idea that global capitalism has uh, driven by the US and, and the European Union principally has created the extreme inequities uh, within and between societies. And then of course, there are historical inequities which are deeply rooted in um, prior to even um, the globalization today. And in every country, there are historical inequities based on racism, case systems, classism, gender, um, ethnicity, religion, and colonialism. So those historical inequities um, are ever present and the human rights agenda has not been able to dismantle them completely. In the 20th century, we've had a growing level of international with globalization has come the glowing, growing level of global criminality and terrorism um, that global nature, the international criminal networks and terrorist networks, networks have been able to um, metastasize beyond national borders. Um, and they have increasingly infused themselves into governance, um, into political parties and into the way countries are governed. Human rights being, as you all know, dependent principally and the responsibility um, and the duty bearers are principally in human rights governments, those who have control in theory over the use of resources and the use of force in society. And then the rising nationalism that has, um, so that has been a part of hi history, um, but in the 20th century, it's because of these other threats have taken on a certain uh, resurgence um, with, with globalization, challenging notions of, of borders and challenging um, the way in which we see uh, sovereignty um, a, a major backlash has happened, particularly against migrants and refugees globally, but also against other um, changes globally and has sort of precipitated a, a, a re um, a, a sort of movement of populism and a rebirth, if you will, of contemporary forms. They're not the same as the um, historical forms, um, but contemporary forms of nationalism. And then you have a declining trust um, in democracy, in uh, democratic processes, which are sort of essential, essentially tied to a human rights framework, both in the sense that the right to vote and participate in governing your own society is a human right itself, and also that democratic uh, societies are those that are most capable of providing for and ensuring human rights. That declining trust in democracy has come with the wave of democratization. Actually, there have been three waves of democratization across the globe. With those waves have come a number of challenges, including high levels of corruption in democratic governments, which has really under undermined um, the sense of popular trust in democracy. And there have also been other challenges to democracy being able to deliver on its economic and social um, promises. The final threat, which I've separated out distinctly to human rights, um, and it's because it's one in which, you know, it has a very specific 21st century dimension is technology. Now, of course, technology is not new with the printing press, with other technologies, with air, um, there, there have been technologies throughout the 20th century that have changed the nature of how we live in society. Um, but the technologies uh, that have happened in the past 20 years take on a new level of urgency um, because of their sophistication and the rate of change, and also that those technologies have been principally within private um, hands, so have been principally um, linked to a, another globalization trend, which is the rise of multinational corporations and corporate power. Um, so human rights and technology today, while not completely new, takes on new, um, new dimensions and has both, you know, positives and negatives. Um, in the early days of the internet, of course, um, and with social media, there was a, a, a lot of assumptions that technology would be a democratizing force 
it would be a force for, for good in terms of um, human rights in that it would allow people more access to information, access to knowledge around their rights, more ways in which they could ensure their rights, more connectivity in terms of working with others in the global network of advocacy, more ability to allow people to organize and to counter um, government action using technology. Um, and that was seen, and there was a lot of assumption that technology was gonna be ultimately a good thing. Of course, the past 20 years has demonstrated that technology um, and particularly technology that is in with the, within the hands of uh, a select and elite uh, set of corporate players um, has very many negative um, impacts and on human rights. One of those is that it has provided governments further tools to crack down on human rights advocates and to monitor and surveil um, their societies and has created an environment of, of fear around the use of technology um, and further, further governance control. But it has also created a, a level of fear within societies around technology taking over um, and uh, basic other ways in which we live our lives, both from the perspective of jobs and the possibility that um, artificial intelligence and other technologies can start to take over many of the ways in which people are employed and take over those jobs, leaving people um, without the potential um, to create their livelihoods. And also in the sense that they, um, that technology in this way is going to take over our bodies, um, that we are going to eventually have uh, the ability to create sort of a, artificial intelligence and and human um, uh, the intersection of artificial intelligence and humans into robots and other ways in which um, we are less human um, because of the speed at which technology is developing. Some people argue that that's in fact emancipatory. There has been in the past 20 years um, an international movement of human rights actors working on technology who argue that technology, if we use it correctly, um, can emancipate people and further human rights ends. Um, part of that thinking goes into um, the ways in which, uh, uh, for example, people might start to talk about a universal basic income, um, where if your job is taken over through a technology, at least there is a way in which you can be emancipated from a sort of worker reality, um, have a basic impact, and income and focus on um, a more fulfilling livi livelihood. But many people believe that technology is now a very binding um, feature, a very constricting feature of uh, globalization and of society and that it is not being monitored and regulated um, under government control sufficiently. And it's extremely unclear future how technology is going to shape um, and, and how society is going to shape technology, particularly in an environment where, as I've said before, governments um, can misuse it and where corporations and others hold a lot of the power and they are not uh, accountable to individuals under, um, accountable to, as governance systems are to individuals under democracies at least. So then uh, moving to the next slide, on top of this, uh, we've had the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has created, as you know, and as we all know, a huge uh, amount of disruption in um, many different aspects of life, much of which are essential in a human rights um, framework. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I did put up the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations sort of key documents that they have put out on COVID-19 um, and human rights, just as a resource base for you, um, uh, if you wanna take forward your thinking and your um, study of the impact of COVID-19 on human rights. Now, many people would have thought COVID-19 is a global pandemic. It's had an impact principally um, on public health and on the right to health. Of course, COVID-19 has had far greater impacts, but the right to health has been um, in that area and public health has been a, a 
hugely and profoundly impacted by COVID-19 with, um, of course, the death toll, um, the global death toll, and um, the amount of illness that those who have been um, subjected to having gotten the virus and the extreme stress that the pandemic has put under many health systems in many countries around the world. Of course, people have experienced and countries have experienced COVID-19 differently. Some countries have had a, a huge negative impact and a number of waves or a very difficult um, third wave. Um, and there are new Delta variants, Delta and Mu variants that are coming out that are continuing to hit um, countries. So this is not over. And some countries have had less of a um, of a big impact from COVID-19 in terms of their actual health system and the amount of people who have died or gotten ill. They've had other impacts from COVID-19, uh, which we will we'll get to later. The other, um, for those countries where COVID-19 has created um, uh, major shifts in and lockdowns, there have, of course, been um, and uh, a big impact of COVID-19 on the economic situation. And here in countries that's at the level of people's jobs and access to jobs, um, the decimation of sort of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises um, that have not been able to, particularly in the service, travel, tourism, uh, restaurant and other areas that have not been able to survive the pandemic, but also globally in the global supply chains um, and in the global economic system that was very dependent on, on linkages across countries, um, which has been hugely disrupted um, by COVID-19. And of course, the, the individuals who are most uh, vulnerable to human rights violations that we talked about before have been um, significantly more impacted than others. Um, children and COVID-19 with the shutdowns and the disruptions in education and with children's lack of ability to be vaccinated. Um, children have been particularly impacted uh, in terms of their growth and development um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Women um, and the girl child have been especially impacted there was a global um, regression on women's human rights uh, pre-existing COVID-19 in, in this sort of rise of nationalism and the decline in trust in democracy, even in democratic countries. Women's rights were at the forefront of those that were under attack. Um, women's reproductive rights being one that is particularly um, sensitive in, in many religious contexts. But other women's rights um, have been under attack. With, with uh, COVID-19 um, impacting women in particular, them having an additional burden in the home, as we all know, as well as many women needing to work to be able to support their families um, and other ways in which uh, women's rights have been impacted, and particularly the girl child um, and those in countries, those girl children who, for whom getting access to an education is essential to their um, individual uh, social, economic, uh, and political empowerment. Um, that has been one of the greatest areas of negative impact of, um, of COVID-19 on uh, progress made in the rights of women and children. Indigenous people and in many countries, the protection of minorities and racial discrimination um, has really emerged as a serious uh, challenge in the COVID-19 area, particularly for countries like the United States who have a profound history of racial discrimination and racial inequity, um, but also for indigenous communities around the world and for minority communities, the inequities in, in the national systems have been heightened by um, the COVID-19 pandemic and those groups have been particularly hit in, in, in terms of health and other impacts. And then we've seen a major rise in hate speech. Again, that nationalism that predated COVID-19, but has been exacerbated and inflamed by the pandemic. 
um, that has taken on new levels of, of um, hate speech within most societies and in the United States, um, in particular, hate speech fo focused on Asian Americans and I'm blaming um, the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, uh, China has been one area of, of particular concern. But of course, hate speech generally against migrants, refugees, against those who are different, against minorities, um, has been on the rise. And then we have, a, you know, a tremendous amount of other impacts of COVID-19, which we can we can talk about um, at length, but they're all very, very um, concerning for from a human rights perspective. And many governments have used the uh, COVID-19 pandemic as a way in which to crack down further on forces of change or demands for further rights and democracy within their countries. So this is both a part of the reality of managing the crisis. So governments have closed their borders, like in Argentina, um, which have meant that, you know, what were otherwise the rights of people to seek to migrate, to seek um, asylum, uh, to be able to move in and out of countries, to be able to see families, family reunification. Um, other issues have been curtailed uh, because of the way governments have decided to address the, um, the pandemic. But then on an even deeper and more concerning level, of course, governments have used the pandemic as, as a means to actually increase their um, capacity to control their communities and to crack down on civil and political rights, not only the economic, social, and cultural rights we were talking about in terms of education and access to health care um, and access to employment um, and a living wage, but on the civil and political rights uh, framework as well, where countries have really um, used, again, surveillance and the technology, as well as passing a, a a range of new legislation and policies that um, that restrict people's right to freedom of assembly, for example, uh, restrict the people's right to freedom of speech during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it is greatly um, exacerbated what were otherwise huge threats. Um, and then it has also had the impact on the global international system with the system not being able to respond to ensure vaccine equity, not the international system, not being at a level of being able to, um, to garner the will and the resources to have aligned all countries into a real consolidated and coherent approach to COVID-19 um, has further sort of eroded um, people's trust in, in multilateralism and the capacity of multilateral institutions to counter global trends. Um, and here, I think it's important to note that um, uh, the international system was um, came under attack in, in its own uh, response to COVID-19. Um, and that has been used by those who um, want to undermine the system further um, in, in order to, you know, uh, further degrade uh, the global capacity for collaboration and for addressing um, global challenges, including climate change, which requires, like a global pandemic, requires major shifts in um, the economies, and um, the globalization and production lines, uh, the way in which people live within societies, particularly in, in richer societies um, across the globe where uh, a, a real shift is needed. Um, and it's a real challenge to those, um, particularly the governments that are grounded on an economy, a natural resource extraction economy that basically ensures the future of their own government and their own society. Um, that kind of shift it, is not possible without a very strong multilateral system. So those who, who are heavily resistant to any kind of global transformation around climate change um, have been helped uh, by the COVID-19 
pandemic. And the COVID-19 pandemic should be a wake up call, of course, that the business as usual that we've had so far in the 21st century in terms of approaching um, global challenges, which we've discussed here, uh, are no longer um, going to serve us all. Although again, the different ways in which societies have managed and responded to COVID-19 mean that people take different messages out of the COVID-19 pandemic and that there isn't global agreement around what the pandemic means for future governance, global governance or future problem solving um, as it goes to other global challenges. I also wanna mention here, obviously countries um, that have internal crises, conflict, um, and um, war where mass atrocities um, and gross human rights violations take place were not stalled by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there was at the beginning of the pandemic a uh, demand by the Secretary General of the United Nations to get the Security Council and the global community to put a halt, a sort of global ceasefire to um, warring uh, factions throughout the world to address the pandemic. Um, and that of course failed. And many of the um, conflicts have continued and in fact worsened. And we've seen uh, now the threat of a number of areas of severe mass atrocities to the point of um, you know, genocide or uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes uh, taking place in, throughout the globe during this pandemic. Um, we have Tigray going on in Ethiopia right now. We, of course, have had Myanmar and others that have um, racked the international community um, without any tools to, to respond in light of the um, impact of, of COVID-19 on the capacities of the international community. And we fundamentally don't have alignment amongst the major players, both in the United States, there has been political upheaval and a lack of, of um, a deep polarization within society and a lack of clarity amongst the community about a way forward. And that's replicated in many countries around the world where there is simply not um, an understanding within populations, a shared understanding of the direction that um, communities and that society should, should take. So where do we go from here? Um, it's, it's a big question um, with a lot of the assumptions and a lot of the um, challenges um, that we have and a lot of unknowns about the way um, actors are going to move forward, um, both actors in the sense of national actors, corporate actors, uh, civil society actors, um, and, and just uh, local communities and, and those um, who uh, have a voice in, in their countries. It's unclear um, what the climate and um, other sort of transformations are, are going to be doing and how much that is gonna disrupt um, on a daily basis people's um, ability to sort of manage and come up with solutions because they're constantly um, dealing with crisis and um, precarity, uncertainty around lives and lifestyles. So there is a big question as to whether what we saw in the 20th century of um, institutions and governments being able to organize in an analog fashion, um, international norms, frameworks, institutions to provide solutions to problems whether that is at all possible. One thing that is a slightly good story from the COVID pandemic and maybe could be seen as a, um, a sort of a window into the potential is the fact that um, vaccines were, were developed in record time and through a mass amount of uh, global cooperation. And that ability of um, scientists to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in that um, quick a fashion, fashion shows that there is potential um, to respond to major challenges quickly and assertively. But that has been limited both from the equity perspectives that we talked about where those vaccines are not available to everyone and also from 
the myths and disinformation perspective that has come with this rise of technology and that many countries, even if the um, vaccines are available in many countries, people are absolutely hesitant and afraid to be vaccinated. And there are major uh, forces against um, the vaccination in myths and disinformation and fueling people's uncertainty about the vaccine. So even where we get global collaboration to solve a problem, unless we have global collaboration to change people's social uh, and economic and other um, uh, situation or circumstances and their ability to understand and filter and um, uh, determine sort of truthfulness of statements and of um, realities and faith in sort of scientific progress um, we will not be able to manage some of the crises that I've discussed. So what is next? So what we see on the horizon um, in terms of trends that have the potential to help um, address these threats and keep and revitalize human rights um, frameworks and human rights demands, um, we definitely see sort of windows or slight areas of opportunity or positive um, momentum. The vaccines being one small example, but more globally, um, we've seen in, in countering these threats, a, a huge rise in um, more successful civil resistance movements. So moving beyond a sort of armed resistance movements that were very much a part of um, power plays in the 20th century, the amount of education, training, um, access to information around concepts of rights and concepts of um, good governance has really created um, many populations who are at this point willing uh, to organize and, and make very clear demands on their governments for change. Um, and those, despite those are on the rise, they are increasingly smart. Um, they're increasingly globalized in terms of learning lessons from each other. Here, technology, again, has both been a useful source, but also um, a very big threat to civil resistance movements. But individuals are uh, increasingly willing to take on power players and have a sense of their own um, individuals and groups um, sense of their own entitlements and, and rights from a very um, grassroots level. Although those uh, civil resistance movements that are most effective do have uh, elite uh, support. Um, so educated individuals and educated groups, they do have labor support and, and they also end up having uh, the ability to divide within governance strain, uh, networks. So they ultimately do need the elite and those who are involved in the governance system as it stands at the time to be supportive for them to be successful. The other trend that we see, and this is in some civil resistance movements, um, but is also seen in other ways is uh, younger generations. Um, so the rise of younger generations of individuals who see the possibilities of a different future, um, who um, have a very firm sense of their uh, rights and entitlements and who are willing to risk and um, question the way in which things are done. Um, that is a, a way in which um, human rights can be regalvanized and, and strengthened. International pressures, on a society, we have not come up with other ways in which we organize our society in which international law is framed. As you know, the international law is framed on the basis of states and state power, um, state sovereignty, and states making their own decisions around their agreements. We have not yet come up with any other system. And global corporate power, while it challenges that system, still remains, for the most part, within that framework as corporations ultimately um, do house themselves in countries. And there is obviously an effort um, by governments to also have a certain amount of uh, regulatory control on corporations. 
But international pressures are, um, you know, are there. They are the threats that on to governments um, that exist, and they are harder and harder to ignore. Climate change, as I mentioned, being one of them, it's simply a pressure that um, that is changing the way in which we live, and that is creating a lot of incentives for governments to try and figure out how to address this. Both governments that um, have an existential, and these tend to be the poorer countries that have an existential threat through climate change, both to their existence, uh, you know, small island states, for example, many of which are having to plan um, futures without uh, actually having their own state land, um, and other states where the, the challenge of global climate change creating mass waves of refugees, or in developed countries, the infrastructure challenges that come through global climate change events um, deteriorating substantially um, the way the people's ways of life, people are starting to really um, recognize some of these global pressures. So it is possible, and COVID-19 being one of them, um, it is possible that uh, the pressures will get so great on governments that they do, there is enough population support to governments in democracies, and there's enough civil resistance in non-democracies that governments simply um, must collaborate better to address uh, these challenges. And then there's the unpredictable players and interests and what will happen with them. Um, global tech being one of the major unpredictable players and some, um, some of the global corporations and their firm interests, uh, many of them see uh, themselves as at this point firmly um, aware of the realities that if they don't change the way in which um, they are acting, uh, that they will no longer <laughs> uh, exist as corporations. So there is a certain amount of um, positives that one can see in some of these unpredictable places uh, where corporations and others are, are really starting to come to terms uh, out of their own self-interest mostly um, that they need to shift um, uh, and they need to support transformation of systems for, for human life and human dignity on a shared planet uh, to continue. But we are lacking ideas and maybe younger generations can help. Um, a lot of what I've discussed is old models and new bottles in the sense that, as I mentioned, we don't have new models of collaboration beyond fundamentally member states um, and corporate power. Um, we don't have um, the will, the political will, particularly in, in democracies and in rich countries, nor do we have the political will necessarily in um, emerging economies and in some of the lower in income countries, nor do we have the resources and control over the kinds of resources that would be needed to create really new institutional models. This is something that if you follow the United Nations, or you follow regional institutions as they've been getting um, more and more sort of out of touch with reality and less funded, less resourced and seen as, as less powerful. Um, there is simply no new, uh, new ideas for a global collaboration. And where international law has been successful in the 20th century, the question remains, is international law the way in which we will actually continue to have governments and societies agree uh, with each other on how to face these global challenges. Um, and if international law can start to have it, a, a renaissance is a, is a big question. Um, international law has been increasingly integrated at the national level, but not fast enough um, to take on some of these really detrimental dynamics and trends. Um, both courts have not been fast enough, judiciaries have not been fast enough, uh, legislation, a lot of it um, has happened to integrate global norms into national agendas, but they are simply not uh, put to pr practice enough. And there is not enough um, resources put behind um, international norms getting nationalized and, and, and truly 
um, coming from the bottom up to create solutions to these global problems. It is a challenge for you as lawyers, as you look forward to what does law look like in the 21st century? Um, how do we make law a much more vital and contemporary power um, in, challenge, in addressing challenges? And that's essential because as we said, human rights does fundamentally find its grounding in, in global normative uh, development in, in international legal frameworks and in an understanding of the international community. Um, and those are really at risk. So what does that mean for, for lawyers today? What do we need to do differently as lawyers and what kind of um, court systems, judicial and broader programs do we need to think about as lawyers that can really support the capacities of governments and societies to be better at, at um, addressing these global challenges. If not, we could see that human rights law and international law um, remains moribund um, in many ways. While it continues to sit out there and it continues to use, there isn't the global political world to revitalize it, to come up with new norms and standards. And we can think about a lot of areas where this is true global refugee law, very outdated, unable to address um, the realities of, of global migration and, and um, disruption today, both in terms of climate refugees, but other refugees. You see the European Union, you see countries in your area of the world and the United States really struggling, um, not able to come up with solutions to those problems. Global drug laws, same moribund and old international legal frameworks around drugs. There's been pushes to reconceptualize, rethink. There have been some um, forays into rethinking international drug laws, but there is tremendous amount of interest around um, international uh, uh, drug issues and a lot of concern about opening up international norms to new models and not getting the fundamental agreement that one needs to create new international frameworks. Uh, around drugs or other forms of, of trafficking and other forms of international crime. And the list goes on. So essentially we're at a point where if we want to be serious about um, the future and if we want human rights, so this concept of human dignity to guide the future and the idea that all of us, no matter where we're from or how we're born, um, have an essential claim as humans to living a certain way on this shared planet. If that's what we're interested in, we have a lot of work to do um, as lawyers and more broadly as um, human beings, as citizens, and as part of a, a broader global society. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, and I, oh, go ahead, Pablo. Oh, no, I just wanted to thank Jelly and, and give the floor to Margaret that is going to uh, present some of the key features of the online LLM under the agreement that we have between WADE and uh, UD Law School. So Margaret, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. And Shelly, that was a magnificent presentation. I, I love the area of international law and it was it was just great to hear you speak. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more, we did um, a post in the chat, the website for the Human Rights Center at University of Dayton, as well as uh, to Shelley's bio. Um, well, I'm Margaret Ioannidis, the director for the online LLM program at University of Dayton School of Law. Um, I manage the overseas, uh, or I'm sorry, I oversee and manage the day-to-day -day operations of the online LLM program. I am a licensed attorney, a former law professor, and I have worked with online LLM programs since 2014. I'm really delighted and honored to be here today. Um, it's great to once again get to see Professor Ianello and Paula, um, and we're really excited about the partnership that we have with UADE. We actually have four UADE students in our online LLM program right now, and if any of you are interested in learning more about the program, please feel free to reach out to, um, to Professor Ianello, to the International Office at UADE, to what my colleague Walter Haas, who's actually working the slide deck behind the scenes here, or to myself. We have our contact information included in the slide. Um, so Walter, we can move to the next slide. 
Perfect. So just a key highlight about our partnership with Wade. There are several key benefits that students, including uh, Made students and Abogacia students, as well as graduates from Wade, will get through the partnership agreement. So number one, if you are a current student in the Abogacia program and you've completed at least two and a half years of study, five semesters, you are able to get an early admission and early start in pursuing your online LLM degree. So while you are working towards your first degree in law, you also can pursue your LLM degree fully online. If you're in a MADE, uh, MADE program, you're able to start the program at any time as well. Second benefit is through the partnership is that we are able to offer credit recognition towards the LLM degree for study completed at UADE. And that allows for up to 10 credits applied towards the LLM degree, which means the program can be completed within 20 credits rather than 30. The third benefit is a guaranteed scholarship, which we have outlined on our next slide. Through this partnership, students are able to complete the LLM degree uh, at all, over a 70% um, discount relative to the published tuition rate. And so students are able to earn the LLM degree for a total of 9,500 US dollars. This amount is paid as students pursue the LLM degree and it's applied on a per credit basis. So there is a guaranteed scholarship applied per credit and depending upon how many credits a student takes each, sem each semester, that is the tuition that is paid. Uh, so the math has been provided on this slide. If, for example, a student started with one course, Introduction to US Law, which actually Professor Ianello is teaching, that course is two credits. And so the total tuition due would be $950. So the $475 per credit times two, the only other charges for the program are university fees that are $25 per semester. So again, using this same example, the total cost uh, would be $975, $950 of tuition, $25 for the university fees. We can move to the next slide. So um, I'd, like, I'd like to give a little bit of background about our online LLM program. What we just presented were the partnership highlights through the partnership with UADE. Um, but again, for those of you who don't have too much background in terms of LLM programs, I wanted to give you a little bit of background now. So an LLM degree is a graduate degree in law. Students who pursue an LLM already have their first degree in law. So again, we talked about one of the benefits through the partnership is that in, um, in your case, you'd be able to start the program even if you have not yet completed your abogacia degree. You are able to, um, to start after you have completed five semesters. Um, a law license is not required and um, students are able to earn the degree through this partnership by completing uh, as little as 20 credits. And again, students are able to complete up to 30 credits if you wanna complete the full online LLM curriculum. We do have three semester starts per year. Students can start in January, in May, or in August. Our next semester begins on January 11th and students are able to take courses during each of those semesters. Again, how many courses you want to take is entirely up to you. And, um, and if you decide as a student to take a leave of absence for one semester, that's fine. This is a very flexible, fully online format. We can move to the next slide. So this is our complete curriculum. It's made up of 30 credits, 12 courses, You'll see that 10 of these courses are in single subject courses that are tested on the bar exam in the US. Uh, they form the foundations of US law and are very similar to courses that students in the US who are pursuing their first degree in law, which is a Juris Doctor degree, would be taking in their first to second year of study. 
So you get that foundation in US law, bar tested subjects. You also get two skills based courses Introduction to US law and the legal analysis course. That legal analysis and reasoning, research, writing, and communication course is one um, that is very skills oriented, where students um, complete legal research. They complete an oral argument and they complete legal writing, um, but it is not a thesis. Rather, it is very skills and practice oriented. So it's similar to what uh, a students would expect if they were working in a law firm in the US or they were uh, arguing before the court in the United States. Next slide. So we mentioned that through this partnership, students can get up to 10 credits of study at UADE applied towards their LLM degree. So we have actually reviewed your curriculum of study and have identified these courses that actually map to corresponding courses in the University of Dayton curriculum. So for those of you who are current students in, uh, in the Abogacia program, you are able to work with us and establish transfer and credit for these courses. For those of you who have already graduated and have your abogado degree completed and are working towards your master's degree, or if you are an alumni, uh, then you are able to apply um, up to 10 credits of advanced standing, uh, regardless of which courses you took as part of your undergraduate curriculum in law. We can move to the next slide. Um, we can move to the next one as well. Perfect. So we talked about what an LLM program is. It's a graduate degree in law. We talked about how Dayton Law's online LLM program is 100% online and focused on a US law uh, curriculum. Now let's talk a little bit more about what the program looks like. Um, it is asynchronous, which means the lectures are pre-recorded and made available to students to be able to access at their convenience. Even your midterm and final exams um, are offered online and students have flexibility as to what day and time works best for them to take the exams. Having said that, we think it's really important for students to have opportunity for live interaction with their professors as well as with their classmates. So students can expect to see weekly office hours with their professors and live sessions. We use Zoom as our preferred platform. So through Zoom, students are able to join with their classmates and professors in optional live sessions. Everything that we do live, we do record so that students who are not able to join or maybe only able to join for part of the live event are able to access the recording at a later time. Um, as I mentioned, we do have three starts per year, January, May, and August. These are also our semesters, and during each semester, students can expect to see four to five classes offered, and they're able to choose if they want to take one course or they want to take all five. It's entirely up to the student. And our curriculum, for anyone who is interested in um, seeking licensure in the United States, our curriculum is aligned with the current requirements for Washington and California. If you visit our website, and I encourage you to do so, and also to feel free to reach out to us as well with questions, you'll see that there is additional information on our frequently asked questions page, and that covers more detailed information about uh, how bar eligibility is established in the US for foreign educated law school graduates, We've also included links there to the National Conference of Bar Examiners website. So I know uh, we have limited time today, but I encourage anyone with questions, please visit our website and then please feel free to reach out to us as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, within our courses, we also have free reading materials, free career uh, counseling services for our students, free academic success services for our students, and supplemental online resources. So I see Paula has come back online. So I think that might be my cue to start wrapping things up. We encourage you again, visit our website, join us for an upcoming webinar through our Law in the America series. Uh, the first step, if you have questions is again, reach out to uh, the international office at UADE and we can skip through the application process is pretty straightforward. Uh, 
So there we go. <laughs> Turn it back over to you, Paula. Oh, oh, Paula, Paula I think you're, you're on mute. Yes, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Now we can hear you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, thank you, everybody, for, for this webinar. Thank you, Professor Seely, Margaret, Walter, and Professor Yanela for, for making this possible. So, um, the students who are listening to this webinar, if you have any questions, it could be like regarding the agreement or also regarding the topic of human rights, please feel free to open your mic or write uh, on, the, on the chat any questions you might have. I see here uh, a lot of uh, congratulations for for Professor Shealy. Uh, Erica says that it was very well explained and, and she thanks her for the webinar. Also uh, Marisol uh, thanks uh, Shealy for this outstanding webinar on human rights and she says that the information has been very interesting and useful for uh, their law studies. Um, OK, also Brisa says that the webinar was awesome and well, of course, she had a, 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 a electricity failure, but she will see the, the, the video later on. Remember that this video will be uploaded on our uh, YouTube channel. OK, let's see anybody else. Thank you very much. Also, Ivana Morillo. No questions, students? No doubt. Well, um, we as as Margaret mentioned, if you want to, um, you know, like ask or consult about, you know, our agreement to continue with an NLM uh, in, in in Dayton School of Law, please contact Guad Internacional. You can ask for a meeting uh, via Teams, right? Or you can uh, write at outgoing at guad.edu.ar or call us or if you come here to the campus when you have classes, yes, you can come. We can uh, host one student in our uh, office, only one because of, uh, you know, like uh, the protocols, but we can uh, help you out uh, if you reach us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.